Originally, I thought, well, if John's going to lend his voice, I didn't feel right asking you to edit you, me, and him. So I said, well, just do the, the raw files and I'll edit the whole thing and put it together. And what ended up, ha I, you know, I was so backlogged that seven days a week I'm doing my regular job and I'm editing and I wasn't doing anything to market the books, the data collectors or this. So nothing was moving forward. Nothing was moving forward in my coaching business. So that's when... I came back to you and I'm like, I can do it. If you don't have time, I can do it. But I'd much rather, this is your area of expertise. So yeah. why, you know, if, if I'm going to hand something off, so I'm just glad that you were, and I appreciate that you were like ebbing and flowing, new email. Oh, the plans change again. <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> so yes, yeah. you're very accommodating. Hello? Rue answer. We're out on the fire escape. She yelled over the roar of an ambulance that went barreling down the street. She covered her left ear and leaned into the phone as if that would make a difference. Where are you? Down here. From the street, Spencer waved his arm wildly, phone still against his ear. Rue saw him and waved back. There stood Spencer. Good old practical Spencer. Danielle Pai, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Graham? I'm doing good, and I promise that first of all, I will not be asking any questions about theoretical physics. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> do you do you want to explain why that's important? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I still get nervous. You and I have talked many times, and we're friends, but I still get nervous on these interviews. There's something about it being recorded and out there uh -huh. that's just very intimidating to me. Um, so in my very first interview with you, um, you had asked me, because on my old bio, I had mentioned having an interest in theoretical physics, which I do, but I haven't st studied it in years. I have a basic cursory knowledge. And one of the first questions out of your mouth was, tell me what you know about theoretical <laughs> physics. And I'm like, I have no idea where to begin. <laughs> I was like, I was waiting for a softball question like, you know, what books did you read as a kid? Or <laughs> So anyway, it became kind of a running joke with one of my friends, Amra. So she gets interviewed periodically for work. And she said, I get up there and she just like with the microphone and people are, she's just terrified. And I told her the story and she's, and from to this day, whenever people interview her and she gets nervous, she's like, at least they're not asking me about theoretical <laughs> physics. Well, I'm sorry for, for doing that to you. I had no idea. I just saw it in the bio. I blame working breakfast radio for the BBC for that because I did that for a few years for BBC Wiltshire. And I used to get guests down the line from like Westminster, you know, cabinet ministers and stuff. And they'd say to you, you only got five minutes with the chancellor or you only got five minutes with the leader of the opposition or whatever. So to make sure that I got bang for my book and you never know when you're going to lose them i always asked the most difficult question first <laughs> just in case i didn't get to ask them any more questions and so and i told them that too i said i made the producers tell them that off the line it's like if you survive the first one the rest is going to be easy <laughs> so <laughs> that's yeah i blame i blame if i'm looking for someone to blame i'll blame the bbc they're big enough. They no can problem. take it. Hey, hey, it was quite an icebreaker. And you made me sound smart, so it's okay. It well, I, I don't even remember how you dealt with it, but I don't remember you floundering. I would have remembered that. So oh. you must have answered it well. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Don't ask me to repeat it because I, okay. I don't remember what I said. But I remember playing it back saying, wow, you know, I didn't sound as stupid as I thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> didn't sound stupid at all. So how are things in Florida? Pretty good. Whereabouts in Florida are you? In Parrish. So what's it called? Parrish. Between, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so south of Tampa, it's near Bradenton, Sarasota. So on it's, the southwest side, the Gulf side. Right. So it's P P A R I S H. Mm -hmm. So where's the nearest big town? The nearest would be probably Lakewood Ranch, Sarasota maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes away. Right. And then Tampa is about an hour away. St. Pete, about 45 minutes to an hour. So we're kind of in the middle of everything. Yeah, on the Gulf side. So you are you protected more there from hurricanes on that side? 
Uh, knock on wood, except for one, uh, Maria was a, a a cat five a few years back. But other than that, we've had pretty good luck. Yeah. Well, let's hope it stays that way, at least till the end of this interview. <laughs> end of the, the internet stays on. The last few days we've had storms and we always go out. So Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, well, I hope so. Maybe I should ask the tough question first then. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so what is this now? Is this... Is if I didn't care, is this the fourth audiobook we've done together? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Fourth. And we did the three data collectors and then this one. And uh, there's, I did two kids' yoga books, but there was never an audio attached to those. Oh, so. see. I see. Right. Okay. And before we get to, to right into if I didn't care, how are the data collectors series? How are they going? Um, not bad. I think I feel as if there was kind of a slump, and part of that was um, my fault, and part of that was circumstance. So it's funny the the first I'm I'm finding out that people are still getting around to the first book because I wrote them probably within what a year and a half. Uh -huh. So by the time people are like, "Congratulations on your your book," I'm like, "Which one?" <laughs> so. <laughs> So um, the first one hit at the perfect time, I think, because it was COVID. People were stuck inside. They had nothing else to do. Um, everybody rallied around me because it was my my first book, I think. And and there weren't enough people who were out of work who knew that they could do audio books and write books. So it hit and it did really well. The second and third, not as much because by then I feel like it was like cutting through the crowd because now everybody's writing books and everybody's at home and changing careers. So it's been a little slow, but um, I've started to ramp it back up again. So Yeah, I need, I've noticed I need when, I've, when I've done series, the first one seems to sell the best. The second one sells like almost like half of what the first one sold. Then the yeah. third one goes like half of what the second one sold. And then every time a new one comes out, the first one starts selling again. Yeah, yeah. It seems like I've a new one. I've seen that happen with the yoga books. Like they'll go in and right. buy this book and then they'll buy one of the yoga books. And I'm not sure um, why or they just said that looks interesting. Um, but I'm in it for the long haul, so I, I'm not – super concerned if it doesn't happen all at once um i wish because there are people who do this full-time they write full-time and then they market full-time and they have two three people to, to help them market right now it's just me and uh cindy who you've met and and uh web designers a couple people that i contract here or there but man if i had the budget and time i could do a lot more with it yeah. <laughs> which is probably what everybody says now, I'm just noticing with your sound, there's a bit of a crackle on it. Do me a favor, just unplug your microphone and plug it back in. It feels like there's, it's almost like a static, and I'm wondering if there's a thing that will go away just by touching mm -hmm. it and unplugging it and, go and, and plugging it back in. Okay. How about that? Is that okay, better? Was, I looked like I was frozen. You were definitely frozen or not. You frozen were fine. On your side. You were fine. I don't know what, whether that means it's at my end. Um, but I've not had any issues up until now. Uh, we've ha had intermittent stuff the last week, so I, I apologize. It's probably it's not you, it's me, Graham. <laughs> so. oh, don't don't worry. I've heard that a million times. <laughs> <laughs> hey, talking of like romance and stuff, although the data collectors are essentially science fiction books, although I don't think that description does them justice they're stories they're just great stories but because they're science fiction you've got so much more scope to to have shapeshifters and all kinds of cool stuff in it it was uh, yeah it was fun because i could break as many rules as i wanted if something didn't make sense in this world it's like oh well i could just create an alien with this power and that explains that and it gives you a lot more playroom to to run wild yes but definitely more about the relationships because i had so many people tell me i'm not a science fiction reader but they love the books because yeah, of I, the, I, the I can understand that i can totally understand that yeah and that's probably why uh, they scored high in Amazon's Amazon's wholesome romance category. Uh, the, not the data collectors. If oh, I which didn't care? That's what. No, that's what, I exactly. thought. Well, 
I mean, full disclosure, you sent me some ideas for stuff to talk about, and that was one of them. And so I naturally assumed that that would be data collectors because, you know, there's it's a so certain PG-13, amount. so PG-13, right? There's, there's hardly yeah. anything. I mean, wait a second. Now let me get... So if I, I didn't know. care... It's like has scored boring, high in Amazon's like... wholesome romance category. You use the F word in it. <laughs> I do. I did in the data collectors too, just in the beginning. And, you know, I had to fight with that because I didn't want to put it in there, but it was legitimate to the character. But right. yeah, um, I don't know why it was listed as wholesome and clean. Now, I suppose if you compare it to some of the erotica that's out there, I don't no, I'm assuming that mine is still relatively PG-13. I mean, it's nothing, you know, it, it's body, but there's nothing really graphic in there. But still, when I saw that, I'm like, hmm, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how they work that one out. Now, this one, I mean, we got, we got uh, progressively more complicated as far as the production went in, in the Data Collector series. Sorry. <laughs> but this one, not only does it use different voice actors, because you voiced all the female parts and I voiced nearly all the male parts. Yeah. We did this on two continents and your husband, John, is a voice in this one as well. How did that happen? Um, originally, it was as I was writing the characters, Detective Ortega, I just kept hearing John's voice. And I and so I thought he was going to be Ortega, and I'm like, just be you, honey, as if you're in a bad mood all the time, and then it'll be perfect. And it just so happened that he was changing contracts, and work got chaotic. So I had said to you, just start recording, and if I can fit him in someplace else, because he wanted to be a part of it, he thought it'd be cool. So I gave him, and then I heard your Ortega, and I liked it so much. I'm like, okay, honey, you have to be somebody else. So okay, so I recast, so I oh, I stole his him. gig. I feel bad now. No, well, that's okay because in the second one, and, and he was, you know, kind of, we didn't have as much time to work on it as I would have liked um, because of the, the time crunch. But the next one should be a little better and we'll have time to work together because his the character of Officer Dennis and Emma Post, they were both supposed to be these throwaway characters. They show up in a couple scenes and then they're done. And as I started working on the second book, I realized they're, kind of the leads so it's the same world but we're we're focusing on different people so he's he's gonna get a, <laughs> a bigger chance just because he's already done the voice so i've committed so, him data collectors was sci-fi i mean there's lots of ways of looking at it but bottom line it was science fiction if i didn't care is murder mystery so why the change in direction I actually thought I was going to start with a cozy mystery um, years ago. In fact, this is kind of funny now that I'm thinking about it. As I'm talking, I'm going to put on the fan because it's it's like 90 it's something Florida. degrees outside. Yeah. Um, and is the buzzing better on the microphone, by the way? It's you good. It's fine. It? Everything's fine. Okay. That fixed it. Okay. I won't, yeah. I won't move. I won't breathe too much. <laughs> um, so... I always wanted to write cozy mysteries. Like growing up, that I was not only did I watch the old Thin Man movies and his girl, Gal Friday and old like old timey stuff. You know, my parents watched Columbo and Matlock and every single like murder she wrote. Um, so I that was what I gravitated. You know, I read Nancy Drew and Agatha Christie and yada yada yada. So I had it in my mind that that's what I was going to write. In fact, when I lived in New York. I may have told you this before, I'm not sure. Um, I wrote the first chapter of a mystery story and I didn't have the rest of the book figured out because I assumed it was gonna get rejected. This was back when they had traditional publishers, not now where there's like four and you can't get a toe in unless you're Stephen King of the world. <laughs> yeah. um, I sent it out assuming it get rejected. I'm like, I'll just keep reworking it until I find something that works. Well, two weeks later, they they accepted it but I didn't have the rest of the book. And this was one of the biggest regrets of my life because of you know being probably very immature for my age, very sheltered. And people are like, well, contact them, make a sign a book deal to get the rest of it done. And I'm like, but I don't have the rest of it. I have no idea what's gonna happen. 
and uh and and sometimes I kick myself like maybe I would have if I had finished it it probably still would it might have still got rejected but I'm like man if it had gotten somewhere then imagine where my life would be now yeah. you know had I not so I kind of look at this that was a very long-winded answer um but this is kind of my do-over so I expected to start with that. It was just the data collectors. The stories, uh, I, I've told you in previous interviews, I just kept having weird dreams and weird like moments that fed into that story. So I just went with it. Yeah. But this one, there's a lot of you in it, isn't there? Because you lived in Manhattan in the 90s. And it yeah. was, you mentioned there, you, you felt that you were immature for your age now. I don't know about that, but you you were you lived quite a sheltered life before that, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. New York was like a, an escape, and it was also a shock. The first two months, I was like, "Oh my gosh, what did I get myself into?" Because you'd come from a uh, cult, a doomsday cult. Yeah, yeah. I actually it was a choice between New York and California, and yeah. I was like thinking I wanted to go to California, and basically, my mom gave my mom is a very loving woman but kind of helicopter-ish, helicopter mom. Yeah. And she said, well, if you go to California, like, don't come back because she wanted me close enough to make sure that I was safe. And so, so she was, was in Pennsylvania. Was this is where the, yes. the doomsday cult was, Pennsylvania. And yeah. Yeah. so it's East Coast. And it's not, it's not like a compound. When we say a cult, like they had different church, you know, like It's locations. not Jonestown. <laughs> no, it's... It, it really sounds weird to say this, but it's probably a kinder, gentler cult when you compare it to some others. Um, I was, and there are people that argue that a lot of mainstream religion are cults, but that's another story. Yeah. So anyway, I forgot where we left off. I ended up in New York because it was I. I the me now would have been like, okay, see ya. <laughs> you know. Okay. The, right. The, the me. The me then was like, okay, I, I can get as far as New York. Um. So, yeah, it, it was in my family's religion, they weren't allowed to vote. But if they did, it was very obvious that they would be right wing conservative. Um, they had, a, you know, there's no gay marriage. Uh, there was an abortion. There was like uh, very it would have been very, very strict in that sense. So going to New York and NYU where like one in four of the people are gay or, or, or transgender, you know, back then. And just seeing this, the different lifestyles, they're very, it's very liberal, of course, progressive. Um, it was a shock for me, yeah. but it was, I'm glad that it happened because otherwise I, this, my experience to the world would have been like really, really narrow. Yeah. So you brought the, cause in the book, the character Rue, which is based on you. So there's an innocence sort of. to the yes, yeah. There's an innocence to the character. And Rue works as well, she does all sorts of things. She ends up working for an investigator, but she she works as a figure model and you did that too. Yeah. Yeah. So not, what is a figure like, model? Okay, so um when I a figure model is a model for artists. So okay. um so I had modeled, this was in Florida actually, for the Ringling School and, and a couple other places, but um, you basically you pose for art students and you have to, you, some are draped, but some of it is just posing nude because the human body is the hardest thing for them to get right. So right. yes, I went from a cult to posing nude <laughs> as a figure model. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Did you and tell your mother that? that did you tell your mother that's how you were earning a living? Yeah, she she actually died um, in 2006, so she was not around to have an issue with it one way or another. And I'm not sure she would have. I, I think a lot of her restrictions were, number one, um, keeping me safe, because I yeah. suspect she grew up in a really bad part of South Philly, and I think that she had some bad experiences and was doing her best to protect me, so that's where some of that came from. Yeah. Um and a lot of that came from my dad. I think, you know, because in his religion, the man had the final say about everything. Women just, you know, fell in line. Um, she never went for that too well. So it was the, the messages she would give me were inconsistent with the church. It right. was, you can be anything you want to be. 
you know, it was, um, in fact, even my dad, surprisingly, my dad wanted me to go to college where they said, well, the, the end of the world's coming, we'll go to a place of safety, you're not going to have time to go to college, you're not going to have, but at least he, I was surprised that he supported me going to college. So that, that was unique. But anyway, what was the question again? <laughs> I was just trying to find out how much of you is in the character Rue because she comes across really well. The the world that she sees that that as a as a reader you see through her eyes is is actually quite a positive place although she's exposed to some you know there's a murder for a start that she witnesses yeah. you know but she still seems to stay positive through it all. And I was yeah. wondering well, that, if and, yeah that's definitely me. And, and actually, John had a really interesting observation about it. He said, you kind of had it with Lucene and the data collectors, but she had her own mess of trouble. He said in this book, it was interesting because Rue seemed to be the, the face of the reader and pretty normal, consistent throughout. And every all the weird characters and stuff's happening around her and you're yes. getting her yes. perspective. Yeah. So, in fact, the only criticism of her character was they were wondering how did she get to be 30 something and so naive? Like if if Spencer is so terrible, why is she staying with him? So I tried to give little nuggets, but more of that come the backstory comes in book two. So I didn't want to give too much away of why she puts up with it other than, you know, so I wrote in the part about having a somewhat sheltered life. Now, in book two, her experience, I'll tell you right now, because it involves a cult, is a lot, is not what I went through. It's right. very embellished for the sake of the story. Um, but it was funny, uh, one of the beta readers was like, you know, why would she put up with this? He's so bad. Her. And I said, I tell you what, I've been in plenty of re relationships where they had no redeeming qualities. It can be done. <laughs> Right. Which is very unfair. But you anyway. got to write what you know, you know. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, so you it write is what you know, and then you just embellish, and you have yeah. to embellish because otherwise the characters are too boring. You kind of, I, I say, I like to like mess with them a little bit. Like, what kind of dysfunction can I add? And I was thrilled when one of my beta readers is actually a friend of mine. She's a retired psychotherapist. And she, I won't tell you which one because it will give something away, but she actually diagnosed one of my characters with a personality disorder. I'm like, <laughs> you know you've arrived when a for real. When your character is so like, three-dimensional, yeah, they've got a personality disorder that's diagnosable by a professional. That's and how good the characters are. I got it right because she she gave you know she said she pointed out all the things in their behavior and she made a suggestion which again I can't say because I don't want to give it away but she made a suggestion to drive it home that this person has this disorder that I wouldn't have thought to put in so I had really like she was such a like I'm gonna see if she does the rest of the books for me because she gave such good insight to the human mind um, just from her her background. Did she diagnose them as a narcissist? She did not... Um, Sociopath? Somewhat. Somewhat, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, you know I who think, it is. Yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> but it is good. I mean, there are, some, there are some great characters in there. And I liked the character of Darwin as well, who, who runs the, the agency that, that Drew works for. Where does he come from then? I t he just was... It's funny, I just heard him in my head as, all right, so the start of the story, we talked about this very briefly in the last interview. The whole reason for this book was an accident. I had just published the second data collector's book and COVID, there was like, there was no vaccine for COVID at the time. A lot of friends were getting sick. It was just things in the world. Politics was a mess. The very first review that came in for the book was three stars. And I'm like, you're killing my sales right out of the gate because it was like, and and what's funny is I don't even know if it's anybody who read the book, Sometime, but that's another story. So I was in such a foul mood and I sat down and I just started writing about a character in a foul mood. Now, it's interesting that that would put me back in New York when I lived in an apartment there. So that kind of had me curious. And I'll, I'll tell you something after about that. But... Um, I just started writing about a character having a bad day and it was like 1,200 words into it. I'm like, oh, you know, there's something to this. Um, 
Darwin was supposed to be, I just brought him in because he's kind of the the Cary Grant and Gal Friday. In fact, he came out nicer than he should have been. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, His Gal Friday with Cary Grant. No. He's not as nice. He, he's Cary Grant, so he's supposed to be so debonair, but he's a reporter. And in the movie, they're showing that all of these reporters are basically a-holes, <laughs> for lack of yeah. better. They're not, they're not good people. So I I actually made him nicer than I should have, but I but there did slip some things in there that I'm like that are a little questionable, and and we'll explore that more in the next book. Okay, so. you were gonna say you can tell something you when you're talking about curious and stuff. Oh, what I thought was so strange. Sorry, um, I was getting when I first started writing this book, I was feeling anxious a lot, and I'm like, why am I anxious? Like I I don't have anxiety. You know, other than giving interviews, <laughs> you know, um, why am I feeling so? I was feeling uptight and I was feeling sad. And why did I go to this point in history when I was writing the book? And when I started thinking about it, as I'm writing the book, I'm revisiting places that I lived and visited in New York. And I did change the name of places where bad things happen because I didn't want to mar a business. Um, so, anyway. I think that was my state when I lived there. And as I'm writing about it, I was starting to get uptight because I was like, I am I probably was a hot mess of a person back then. Right, <laughs> so, and okay. And knowing that, it, was, it got better. Once I realized that, I'm like, oh, that's probably what it is. And I actually wrote in, I was like, you know, I got to make some, some better experiences here. So I wrote in the Buddhist temple because there is a Buddhist temple on Mott Street. That was one of a couple places that I would go to kind of relax and decompress, I would sit in there and, and meditate. And even though I'm not particularly Buddhist, I felt very comfortable there. So I had I wrote that into to it as well in some other places. But so is writing therapy for you then? I didn't intend it to be, but uh, I, I guess in a way it sort of is. I, I definitely think it's a creative outlet for me. I, I you know there there is something to. Um, narrative therapy where if people are writing it's supposed to be the equivalent of like three psychotherapy sessions so there is validity to it um, I don't know that that writing books is necessarily therapy it's it's fun <laughs> and and maybe that's why I like it because the rest of my world is so structured and organized I'm, I am a professional writer but it's all academic nonfiction and this I just get to play and do whatever I want <laughs> right so is writing the book as much fun as performing for the audiobook then as much I think they're on par not right. the editing the editing is a pain <laughs> is it ever yeah <laughs> but but, but we shared it this time we shared it so you didn't I, have to I put up with me whining that. about it and <laughs> Because it was it was a lot less than half for me, and you didn't have the whole load of we we shared that this time, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, and I appreciate that because originally I thought, well, if John's going to lend his voice, I didn't feel right asking you to edit you, me, and him. So I said, well, just do the the raw files, and I'll edit the whole thing and put it together. And what ended up, ha I, you know, I was so backlogged that seven days a week I'm doing my regular job and I'm editing, and I wasn't doing anything to market the books, the data collectors are this. So nothing was moving forward. Nothing was moving forward in my coaching business. So that's when I came back to you and I'm like, I can do it. If you don't have time, I can do it. But I'd much rather, this is your area of expertise. So yeah. why, you know, if, if I'm going to hand something off, so I'm just glad that you were, and I appreciate that you were like ebbing and flowing and the new email. Oh, the plans change again. <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> So, yes, yeah. you're very accommodating. <laughs> well, Julie said to me, how's it going with Danielle? I said, well, she says she's going to take it all on. I said, but I bet she's going to come back to me. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said it. But you didn't come back to me with all of it. You came back to me with, with just chunks of it. And I think that worked Did you that think that I wasn't well. going to be able to figure out the editing or you just figured out that it would just be um, too tedious or... I know how I, I think I'm reasonably quick and I know how long it takes me and I you know but I manage I'm much better at managing my time than when I first when we first started working together and I was still learning 
you know, I'd been doing audio books. I think when we did your first one, had I been doing audio books about a year or just coming up? Um, I'm not sure. I was I, I wasn't it as was, far it was, into it. It was uh, September 2020. Because I remember you turned it in like right before my birthday. Right. Well, I started around about May 2020. So, oh, so four months in. So I was probably one of the first books you did. Well, actually, no, because I got a lot very quickly. I was very lucky. So, but I was I, but I but the thing is, I wasn't. I mean, I knew how to, uh, you know, produce the audio books, but I wasn't as good with time management. Because there's a lot of things I have to keep doing. I mean, I have to keep, I have to find time to, to audition, for instance, because I have to have a pipeline. Otherwise, you know, you know, I work on up to eight books at a time. And to keep yeah. that up, I also have to find time to audition. And, uh, and I hadn't worked out how to block out time and whatever. And so if a book that I'm doing suddenly needs a lot of editing, then it's like, oh, God, I could be auditioning now or I could be working on that other one with a deadline coming up and, uh, and you know, meh, whining. Um, now I'm really good at that. And and if you say, like, oh, can you edit these? And I go, okay. And then I put things in my diary and I go, oh, yeah, fine, I can do it. And the fact that I know that it's got a time for me to do it and around about how long it now, I know how long things take, which I didn't know it as much in the beginning. I can now relax then going, yeah, look, there's plenty of time. Look, you're gonna. This you're worried about doing this. No, you've got this. And look, you've got your audition, and you're gonna do that on Thursday afternoon or whatever it is. And I'm just much better at that now. And I knew that you suddenly having to do the editing because it catches you out. It takes way longer than you think. And you've got when you've got so much else on your plate. Because I maintain that stress only comes, only comes when you're doing one thing and you're worried you should be doing something else. Yeah. So to take the stress away is to give everything its slot and its time. And then you go, I should be doing this now. This is what my diary says I'm doing this now, and this is all I'm doing. I know I've got that, but I'm doing that then. There, look, there's its slot. So then all the stress goes away because, you know, and I'd, right. I'd, and I, I'd, it, I'd got to that it place. It come down to, and I do, but I do a ton of voiceover work and editing on my own, but it's usually just one voice my voice somebody else's voice it's not usually number one the back and forth between several voices yes. and then it had to be mastered just so it doesn't yes. just have to sound good because it has to be according to their specifications and i think yes. the, the thing that tripped me up two things to your point about um everything in its place it's different when i'm working for somebody else and i know this is greedy i know i'm making money when I'm editing my own stuff and I'm like, I'm not marketing the books or making money at it. It's just me doing it till it's done. And, yes. there, and there was that anxiety of if I take too long to do this, then I'm missing that long tail, like running promos and things because there's a natural drop. And then you do some promos and try to kick things back off. So things were starting to like flatline. And I'm like, I can't even get back to that until I take care of this. So yes. that was, uh, and, and you're right. I, I mean, I learned, I should have had a checklist for the order of things because I learned after the first two chapters that I was organizing it the wrong way. Um, it, like instead of, instead of making sure the levels worked first before the edits, I was editing things together. Anyway, long story short, I realized I did things in the improper order and it made it harder for me to go unravel it after the fact. You were trying to match levels as you as you were editing. Yeah, no, you've got to take that. You whatever it is, when you've got more than one character, they're all on each. They're on different tracks. And I hope we're not just getting too inside here, but maybe there are people who do audiobook narration that are and editing watch this. But yeah, I learned out pretty. I learned pretty quickly that you put everything on its own track and you match all the levels to all the tracks, three tracks yeah. or four tracks or whatever it is. Get them all matched before you start trying to stick them together. Yeah. That's, yeah. And then, yeah, and, right. And everything, the noise like, floor, the levels, right. everything, get them all as close as you can get before you start. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the thing I was, you know, I had everything edited, so it sounded good together. And then it would say the no noise floor is too low, but it's only no too low in like one spot. And then after everything, it says it passes the ACX check. Right. And I haven't run any of the macros. So then I run them and then suddenly something's off and I'm like, what is off? <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. 
So I yeah. think by chapter three or four, I kind of got into the groove, but it's just, it's, you know, and I'm sure you're a lot faster than me, but it's just um, very time consuming. Even when I got a handle on it, I'm like, this takes some time. But so. it's worth it because I like the way it come out with the different voices from the different actors. I think it, it really works well. Yeah, it really does work well. I like it better because there are you know, there are times where I was halfway through this thinking, oh, I should just let Graham do the whole thing, <laughs> you know, or, you know, uh, but but I do I like it better with the the multiple voices and this one we add, I added a few sound effects which uh, I don't know if other audiobooks do that, but I felt like it added. I didn't do a ton, just enough to give it a little character. Yeah, I I tend to when I do mine, I stay away. I do. If there's someone on the phone, I will make the person on the other end of the phone. I'll give them a filter so that they sound like they're on the phone. I'll do that. Yeah. I won't use music beds. I won't use sound effects. But sometimes if there's a particular, once again with phones, if there is a, a number unobtainable, if somebody dials a number and it comes back, this number is not available, I'll try and find that thing on YouTube and lift the audio off. So rather than me trying to fake what that sounds like, I can actually use yeah. the real thing. But I don't tend to use music beds or sound effects. Like you've even got, there was a siren in it, wasn't there? Yeah, I got a siren. Um, I have some at the nightclub which uh, I love your smells like teen spirit, by the way. We did just enough under fair use where I won't get sued. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. but uh, so, th so there's some nightclub music in there. Um, and You see, I, I couldn't I do that because have... I wouldn't know where to stop. I know yeah. me and I, would, I wouldn't know where to stop. If I was doing nightclub music, I'd be like having it once they moved into, if somebody moved into another room, I would change the perspective of the sound because it's, it's, if it's coming from the main room, I would, I would go way too far if I was Which putting... at some point, you know, if I ever have the budget, I would, I would make this into like a multicast full production because I think that would be so much fun um, to do. I mean, you just, they, they used to do that, you know, with old plays on old records where they'd have all the, you know, but you'd actually see people standing in front of, you know, a microphone with like a wooden block and making it sound like the horse. Or a door horse frame horse. with just a door in it. And they go, Kut -dum -kut. they actually exactly. do it live. They do that on, um, well, they used to do it on BBC Radio 4 for a serial called The Archers, which has been running for, I don't know. 70 years or something it's been running a long long time and they used to do all the sound effects live when they recorded yeah. it yeah it really was but like how a fun door would that be and... to do something like that now but with the technology we have because I mean, yeah. there are so many you know at least i found free sites where you could go and snag some some you know background music in fact um your friend Ish ishkia if i'm saying ishkia, her name right yeah. on twitter she put posted something. There were sirens and these card making these donuts outside. It was going, noise. yeah. She's yeah. talking over it, and I'm like, and I'm watching the clip, and I'm thinking, stop talking. That's good audio. <laughs> and then so I commented, I'm like, save that clip. You might need it because I have a sound effects file now that I drag everything into. Yeah, yeah. You had a uh, clip too on Twitter. You you were posting photos from a trip. You know when you were in London for the day. And you were standing on a platform and the train was leaving. Oh, yeah. And I could hear yeah. some background talking. And I was like, everybody needs to stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs> because that was such a good clip. I was like, wow, that is something that could be used. So I, I literally just I stuck my phone this... against the window as we left Blackfriars yeah. Station. Because I love Blackfriars Station. When I worked in London, I used to get on the train here in Hitchin. And 31 minutes later, he used to get off at that station. So I've, I know Blackfriars Station really well. And it's the station that's on the bridge over the Thames. And it looks at Tower Bridge and the, the Shard, which is the biggest building in London, and the Walkie Talkie, which is where the Sky Garden is, which is a restaurant we like to go to. And I just, I love the view from Blackfriars. And when you leave Blackfriars, you leave over the Thames. It's like low level flying it's cool and, uh, <laughs> so when we left that was on our way home i put the phone against the window and just but yeah there's people on the train but there's there's always people on a bloody train i don't know i there's something about i mean we've got rail Damn strikes those, those pedestrians who want to 
travel? Well, no. <laughs> when, when, when we used to live in, we used to live in Swindon, which is an hour from London. And when we used to go into London, it used to take an hour. And I, there's a coach on the train you can book a seat in, and it's called the Quiet Coach. Do you have them in the U.S.? Uh-uh. Where no. people, if you're going to go in there, you have to be quiet, right? Oh. And if you're ever in Britain and you decide, I'm going on a longish train journey, I'm oh. going to book it, and you're on your own. If you're with someone, you don't want to be in the Quiet Coach, you want to talk. But if you're on your own, <laughs> you don't want all this going on. You shut up. So I booked the seat. I used to book a seat regularly in the quiet coach. And every time I got in there, people would be talking. And I'd find oh. myself going, I'd find myself going, quiet coach, <laughs> as if I was coughing. You need one of those signs, like Wiley e. Coyote and the old Bugs Bunny with the sign he's, he's always holding up, like, yeah. shut up. <laughs> yeah. But there are stickers on all of the windows that say yeah. quiet zone, right? But the problem is the stickers are in the wrong place. When you get on the train, they shouldn't put the stickers on the window. They should put the stickers on your mouth. <laughs> yeah. And then it would, like then no it would flash work. Photography. Somebody standing next to the no flash photography side shooting off. <laughs> yeah. Like gaffer tape people, like everyone's been kidnapped. That would work for me on the train. There's always somebody on. And yeah, they ruined my video. I should have. I mean, I just tweeted it straight off my phone. Maybe if I'd taken it home, I could have easily taken the soundtrack you off and just played it You could probably cut the noise and then get some oh, noise easy. from someplace else and overlap it. And I think of that just because I do so much um, videography where we're doing a voiceover and I have to get footage. You know, and I think I've gotten a ton of footage and I've got 15 clips. And then all of a sudden I realize I'm only two minutes into like a 15 minute production and i'm because even when you watch a documentary it's more than three or four seconds you're getting bored with what you're looking at so anyway yeah. every time i see clips like that and and having gone outside i've tried to get some for meditation videos and you realize how noisy the world is um you know you're, you're out on the water you hear the birds you hear nature that's what i want to hear and then as soon as i start recording you know, a plane goes overhead or there's somebody talking on their phone and I'm just like. <laughs> That's why years and years ago when I was at radio school, I met someone there who'd come from TV and they were talking about how in TV they always record, they call it wild track. So they find a bit of atmosphere of what they want and they just record that straight so that whatever they're doing, they can put that over it. And I used that trick many times. I used to go to radio conventions in the U.S. And one of the ways I used to go to them for free was I used to say, how about when I'm there, I make a podcast of your conference, which means I'll interview each of the delegates as they get off stage. I'll, introduce, I'll interview some of the people who have attended and I'll put it all, I'll edit it all together and it'll be the podcast review of the thing. I said, I won't use any of the audio from the sessions themselves, but I'll talk to the speakers and I'll talk to you know, yeah. people who've gone. And, and they, they always went for it. And I worked with some great people. Michael Harrison in New York was great. And Don Anthony, who I did them in Chicago and Atlanta and all, all over the place. But because you're at a conference, the, the background sound, if oh. I grab an attendee, you know, straight after he's come off stage, it might be backstage, it might be really quiet. And then if I talk to somebody who's just there, it might be really loud or it might be over lunch or in the bar or whatever. So I learned that trick and I, I used to go around and record one of the first things I did when it was buzzing and everybody was there, record just 10 minutes of just people, blah, 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 just all like, talking. Like so you can filter it. Is yeah, well, I'd take, I'd take that, I'd take that and then I'd loop it so I had like half an hour of it. And then okay. when I'd edited all the bits together, I would then put that whole thing underneath the whole thing. So it sounded like I was just going from room to room, just talking to people oh, because I had the wild track underneath. So that's a little trick. That's a TV trick, but it works for audio only. Is if you're doing something like that, say if you're if you were going to film something in, I don't know, in some gardens, then you just make sure you record like three to five minutes of just nice sound so that if when yeah. the, you get the money shot a plane goes over then you can just put that oh, underneath yeah. everything <laughs> that's that's what i ended up doing in fact we went to sedona this was pre-covid and early in the morning i actually just took my phone and was just recording the birds early morning and just saving yeah. it and then i would take video i would take the sound out and and do that and then also 
you know, getting the room to like, one of the things I used to forget doing videography is getting enough of the room tone where at least you can do a noise removal after, which of course you do all the time with the books. But when I, when I was doing meditations, I, you know, had not done that before. So, yeah. 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 Cause in radio, we used to every year when I was a program director, I had to send one of the journalists out to record a minute silence because every year, <laughs> Um, on the 11th of November for Remembrance uh, for Veterans, the, the radio station broadcast a minute of silence and all of the broadcasters throughout the country, most of them comply with this, everybody does it at the same time at 11 o'clock, the 11th hour of the 11th day, 11 no, uh, of November, to remember veterans who didn't come back. And But of course, on radio, you can't broadcast silence because first of all, it sounds like the station's gone off the air but second of all, most stations at the transmitter site have a detector that detects silence and kicks in the emergency tape. <laughs> you know? so, you, so you have to have something. So they would go out and just record the sound of atmosphere and we'd put it on at exactly the same level or the level that was just above the level that the silence detector was. And it's so tempting to be like, can't we just get a sound effect that's like from Africa or something? <laughs> so it doesn't sound like the south of England. It sounds hey, you like... were preparing for audio books even back then. <laughs> it's, it's all been. It's yeah. It's all. It's but now look at it. Look at it. I'm four four books with you. Four books. I know, but now that you told me you expected me to hand that back to you, I'm like, damn it! I wish I did the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the last I time I get any me. editing work from you. <laughs> look at that now. Look at that. <laughs> But away from the book, as a freelance writer, you, you've ruffled some feathers, haven't you? Particularly male feathers because of an article. Yeah, you know, it doesn't happen too often um, because I think I'm a kinder, gentler. I try to be very diplomatic in my articles. So I wrote one. This, was, this made me laugh. So I wrote this article. I was seeing a bunch of things. I usually, if I see something on trending on social media that kind of sets me off, I, I, I think, okay, I need to write an article about it. And because, like, when I grew up, it was women got married. They were supposed to have kids by a certain age. Like everything was defined. And every time you went somewhere, it's like, are you seeing anybody? Are you, when are you getting married? When are you having kids? When are you going to have another kid? Um, and there, and women start to feel like there's something wrong with them if they don't get married or if they're not in a partnership, like they're unlovable. In fact, I will... Can I read you a clip really fast? I will. I promise I'll get to yeah, the story. Yeah. No, it's good. We were putting uh, together for work. I wanted to do something about the women's journey. And we talked about this in the last interview, so I won't go too much into it. But one of my colleagues pulled a quote from a 1955 Frank Sinatra movie, A Tender Trap. And the character, a, a woman, obviously written by a man, but it's, uh, I guess it was Debbie Reynolds. And she says... Marriage, I hope, when, when he's, she's, she's hoping to lure him in. A career is just fine, but it's no substitute for marriage. Don't you think a man is just the most important thing in the world? A woman isn't a woman until she's been married and has had children. 1955. Wow. Wow, that's <laughs> and painful. So, and, and unfortunately, people feel that way. So I, I'm seeing a lot of trending about... Still, I think people still are writing like... Uh, you know, they feel like there's something wrong with them if they're not, not as much. I, I do think that the next generation um, is more savvy, uh, but I wanted to write, so it was basically, that was very long-winded again. Um, you know, if you're a 30-something-year-old woman and you're not married, there's nothing wrong with you. And it ended up being the most popular article where women were writing, thank you, I needed to hear that you know, because they, you know, and, you know, some people would say, what about if you're 40? What if you're 50? What if you're 60? I'm like, it doesn't matter. Your worth is not based on it, whether a man or a woman or whatever your relationship is, you know, you have love in your life, you have family and friends, but it, it's not defining who you are and your worth if you don't Because they don't say that, that about men. Yeah, some, you know, I think for some men, I'm pretty sure John got pressured, like, why aren't you married yet a, a little bit? But it's definitely not as extreme, I think, for, you know, for, and this gets back to even religions um, and culturally, you know, women are, had pretty defined roles. 
you know, yeah. with the exception of, he, of here when, you know, the men are going to war and then you have Rosie the Riveter, then it's okay for the women to work. Um, but how and, they, and funnily you know, enough, if you look at the movies that were made, the Hollywood movies that were made during that time, there's a lot of powerful women, a lot of sassy women in those movies. It, and, and that's at the time when the women were staying at home and the men were going to war. When they made yeah. those movies, a lot of the a lot of the very very strong, the comedian yeah. Greg Proops was on about it in a podcast years ago, and and he's right. There were some very very sassy, bold women, you know that I don't think Hollywood had seen before. But that that's when they came through then. Yeah, and I, I think Hollywood does a good job when I when I look at old movies now and I the message they're trying to convey, I feel like they oftentimes were very progressive for the time. Not the one example I just gave you, but there are a lot who are trying to push buttons. Anyway, so I write this article and this gentleman, uh, Leonardo, we'll just call him Leo. Uh, I don't know how old, I'm assuming late 20s, early 30s, but he, he makes this comment, well, if you were single at 37 and got married at 38, are you sure it wasn't out of desperation? And Obviously, um, if if you get to be 35 and you're not married, then clearly you don't understand men or yourself. And wow. Yeah. And I was laughing because if I thought that there was any truth to it, I probably would have been upset. And I wasn't even going to respond to it at all because it was. But then I thought, you know, if there are women who read the article and then read the comment, it's going to feed into that belief system, which was the point of writing the article. Um, and I didn't want this whole nasty gram chain. So I just I sent a polite, you know, thank you for your email. Um, however, I do think you missed the point of the article. And he was saying if you if a woman's 35 and hasn't found love. And I said, what makes you think that? I haven't had found love or somebody else hasn't just because they haven't gotten married and found that life partner doesn't mean that they didn't have successful relationships in the past because i guess i have a different view if you're in a relationship for three years or ten years and it's great at the time that was where you were meant to be at the time you learn what you needed and maybe you outgrew it but i wouldn't say that that's a failed relationship i'd say that's a relationship that ran its course yeah. um, and i didn't go into this with with mr leo uh but i said i i agree with you that people should have an understanding of other people and themselves before they get in a relationship so you know uh, in in my own life yeah sure a little bit of emotional intelligence was a good thing but the reason why it was so funny him telling me that i don't understand men or myself is right next to his comment it says you know board certified positive psychology coach specializations in mbti personality type training and emotional intelligence training so it is literally in my job description <laughs> <laughs> to know to this seek, stuff <laughs> to seek to understand myself and others and help other people understand themselves on a daily basis so i yeah. actually thought it was funny <laughs> and what does he do he drives a truck or something you know. Oh, I don't. I I remember, but I don't want to. But it wasn't connected to to the world that you're in that does look at that deeply. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he's either chronically single or chronically in a new relationship. Uh, right. And that's not based on that feedback. I'm like, and that's a very strong belief. And that was the point of writing the article. It's. He seemed to have a number. 35 was a cutoff. If you're 25, you're okay. But if you're 35, oh, like, so it's interesting how, what people's beliefs are about things. Like, if I don't have this, then I'm a worthless person. So. Yes. But I think people often use those things as shortcuts for actually working out what their issue is. You know, something to blame or whatever. You know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I think people do like, people People don't enjoy thinking <laughs> as often as they yeah, should Yeah, critical do. thinking is hard. <laughs> yeah, it is hard. And, and, um, and they would rather just have all the rules laid out and then go, when this, this, when slot A and tab B go together, that makes this, when it doesn't necessarily do that. And, uh -oh. uh, which is probably why you're such a great writer. Yeah, so we're going to do, uh, two, well, if you're willing, there's two more of these. 
I, I don't know why I write in threes, but they are not going to be the mistake I made with the data collectors. You do not have to read them in order. You can read them in any order. And uh -huh. the focus is, is uh, different for each. Um, I'm going to make you sing again. Great. <laughs> if you don't mind being an, an 89-year-old uh, <laughs> philanthropist. Oh, I'll have a bash at that. <laughs> and then... Um, I want to do, after that, I want to finish out, we were supposed to do a, a Acting Out Yoga, a third book on meditation that was going to take place in New Mexico. And I started writing this book and that kind of got put on the back burner. So I definitely want that. Um, so that's on, on the book world. And what I'd really like to do, and I have to, this is something this week I have to wrap my head around, is you have lots of classes online about how to write a book or how to a coach that's going to make you get your book done but but i would like to use what i know on emotional intelligence on personalities on how to develop characters so it would be a a an actual online workshop on developing the characters making them nuanced um, and even emotionally dealing with things like rejections and bad reviews. And and uh, so I'm kind of figuring out whether it's going to have an in-person group coaching element or it's going to be strictly something they can do on their own. So I haven't worked it out perfectly, but I I, I haven't seen it out there. So I, I think I want to write it. Wow. So if someone's got an idea for a story and they need to flesh out the characters, this would be re and there isn't anything really like that, is there? I'm going to do a little more market research and see, but most of what I'm seeing is people who can't get either can't get the book done or they get the book done and they're like, how do I market it now? This is strictly how to build better characters, how to build better dialogue. You know, my descriptions are not as good as my dialogue is, I think, is strong. And so that's kind of. Yeah, it is. It is. The dialogue's very strong. You know, yeah. And I see too many people, even on Twitter, like they, they, think if they don't sell a lot of books or they get a bad review that they should just quit. And and my feeling is, you know, it doesn't matter how bad you are. It's, even if it's true and you're the worst writer in the world, you like anything else, if you want it, you work at it and you get better at it and you build skill. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I remember or when maybe I first I'm just got... delusional. Maybe I'm just delusional. <laughs> no, I, I think it's the same as anything. If you ask anybody who's done anything, even people who... um. When you first start doing something, you you suck at it. And you just keep doing it and keep doing it. When you first take your first, as a child, your first unsupported steps into the world, the first thing that happens is you fall flat on your face. And if you followed that logic, you'd never learn to walk. But you just keep going and keep going. And then you toddle for a couple of years. And then after a while, you get pretty good at it. I mean... Yeah. Young baby doesn't turn around and... And, say, and, and, and run know, a marathon. They, giggle. they don't turn around and say, wow, I suck at this. I guess I can't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. But that's what adults do, you know. Well, uh, yeah, and it's it's and it's and funny. It's like you either can do it or not. There's there's that fixed mindset of, well, I'm just not good at that. It's like, well, get good at it. You yeah. know, some, you know, even whether you have a nat, people have natural talent. I have, I still suck at the piano. I'm going on five years in September. I am getting better, but I'm terrible at it. Am I ever going to going to be a professional piano player? No. But can I get? Am I far enough along where I can play and sing? You know, yeah. it, with a few mistakes. So, you know, I just uh, yeah. yeah. And it's about and if you're putting something out there that's going to be judged, which you would with a book, and especially these days where you know people can comment on it in real time without even you know. reading it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and have an, they might have an ulterior motive, you know, um, and we all know that that goes on, that if, if I think you mentioned it to me in your email that, you know, you, you might get a what? bad comment yeah. from a rival, you know, you, you don't know they're, they're, they're faceless, you know. So if you're putting something out there, the thing you really need is you need some kind of confidence so that when you do get a knock and you're going to get them, you can go, oh, to hell with them. I'm going to carry on. But you're only going to get that if, you've, if you're insecure about what you do, then it's a shame, isn't it? Because that, 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 that fear of that does hold us back and we make excuses. We go, oh, I don't have time to do that. Or, you know, oh, no, I'll stick to this because, you know, there's more money in this or whatever. And, and loads of people are holding back at doing something that would be really fulfilling for them 
just because you know they've got this this fear of being judged it's 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 a fear of failure but it's actually a fear of success because the two are the same two two sides of the same fail. coin you have to fail as much as you possibly can <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah. Uh, and i confess that i lost a little bit of that when the it slowed down but hopefully i you know i looked meaningful <laughs> when you were talking so i missed a little i apologize i missed a little bit but i got the gist of what you were saying yeah. but uh yeah and and you have to take everything with a grain of salt. I, I, one of the things I, I, I noticed for me and I noticed another author, when they had a promo and right before they hit number one in the category, all of a sudden this one star comes in and it's not verified and there's no, if you're going to give me a one star or a two star, at least say, I hate the plot, aliens aren't real, <laughs> you know, the book cover's funny, give me some kind of feedback. And when yeah. it happens, when it's that close on a promotion, it makes me think that there's something else happening and one of them i actually know was a, a female sci-fi writer in the same genre and when the review came in and i'm like that's something's fishy either she really thought so highly of her own work or you know and and it could be that they hate it i mean you know it, and i realize not everything you do is your cup of tea but you know i wish people i wish people would think a little before they did something like with Rhett, when I used to work for restaurants, I'm going off on a tangent again, but um, I, I did some publicity work and somebody would go to a restaurant that's like a top of the line, five stars, great service, great food. They had a bad experience. Something happened. The waiter, I don't know, was, was having a bad day. They got the order wrong, something. They go home angry and they, a one star review. And you're now you're screwing with that person's business and livelihood because of your one bad experience, people don't think about the cause and effect. And likewise with books, they the person giving that review probably has never written a book and they're not qualified to judge, but they'll read the description to get better recommendations from Amazon. And I'm like, I wish people would just pause and think about what, what the effect is of their minute of whatever that was <laughs> yeah 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 but if Sorry, so so my... your advice then if somebody has got an idea for a book they should just get on and do it then but know that it's going to be a lot of work <laughs> yeah so it's if i didn't care it's a it's the first in a series of three it's by daniel pie again it's out there as a book. It's now an audio book as well. There's a link to everything you need to get it down there in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. Daniel Pai, always great to talk to you. Thank you. Now, if somebody wants to get the book for free, you do have a limited number that you are willing to give up for free, Daniel. How does that work? Uh, yep, 10 copies. So the first 10 people who are listening to this, if they want to email me, danielle at birdlandmediaworks.com, I will send them. And I'll them put that in the link. Free author I'll put direct. The... Yeah, it's from Authors Direct, a free code to uh, download the book. There's no catch. You don't have to do a nice review or anything if you, you don't, don't want. I mean, it'd be uh, lovely if you love did, a nice obviously. Review, yes. I, but there's, you don't have to. If you, if you want to, I would be grateful. Unless you hate it, then email me privately and uh, I am open to feedback. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First 10 people to do that and the email address, if you missed it, it'll be in the description if you watch on YouTube. Daniel Pai, thank you so much. Thank you.